It's a pleasure to have uh, Don with us. Uh, Don Woodard um, leads data science for Uber Maps, which is the mapping platform used in Uber's um, rider application, driver app, and decision systems, um, including the pricing and dispatch. Um, the team's uh, technologies that she's overseeing include roadmap and points of interest definitions, map search, route, op route optimization, travel time prediction, which we know we can confirm you do you, you understand deeply and do a good job with, uh, and navigation. Uh, so um, Dawn did her undergraduate work at Stanford in math and CS and then went off to Duke, where she did her PhD in statistics, and then she became a faculty member in in OR and information engineering at Cornell, where she worked on a number of projects, including um, uh, ambulance decision support systems, um, uh, optimization of, 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 I guess, placement for ambulances, including, um, but actually a variety of interesting projects, even in, in medical statistics, performance assessment for radiologists. I was looking over, over your papers just now. I didn't even know you were in that field, doing work in that field earlier. Um, uh, after um, she got her tenure at Cornell and she came to MSR for her sabbatical, that's where I got to know her. So we actually um, we were delighted to to um, to provide uh, Dawn and her student uh, at the time uh, with just a family and a home up in Seattle, and I think that was, it worked out really well. We had a lot of fun working on um, uh, with Paul Koch uh, and, and and John Sum on um, doing predictions with with. Um, uh, traffic predictions and forecasting with Bing data. And at the time, Bing was quite generous with, with uh, data sets and um, um, with helping us with, with that, that research project. It's kind of extended ClearFlow, the ClearFlow effort, which is now shipping worldwide. Um, and uh, we were surprised to find out that she, instead of going back to Cornell straight ahead, I guess you went back for a little bit to Cornell. Um, uh, no, I was never at did? Stanford afterwards and then... So it's right to Uber. To okay. Uber. I know at one point in time she tried to recruit me to come to Uber. <laughs> <laughs> it was very informal, though. Uh, and, uh, but we've, we've stayed in touch, and it's great to have you back to, to tell us today about um, matching and dynamic pricing for ride hailing. So, Don. Thank you so much, Eric. It's great to be back at MSR. I had an incredible experience the last time. I was here despite the little disruption. I think we really landed with an amazing project uh, here at MSR in, in Redmond, working together with a big maps team. So I'll talk a bit about maps today, but I'll also uh, I'll focus on the pricing and matching techniques uh, that you might be familiar with as a user of ride hailing platforms. I'm gonna start with a story about surge pricing. So this is an example of a situation where surge pricing worked well. This is the close of an Ariana Grande concert in 2015 in Madison Square Garden. The period in yellow is the time period in, in which surge pricing kicked in because demand was very high at the end of the, at the, end of the event. And uh, so on the x-axis, we're looking at time. And on the left, you can see the number of ride requests. And you can see that at the end of the game, the number of ride requests does go up. Surge pricing kicks in. And as we look in the middle plot, we see that the time to pick up, the time between when the rider requests and when they're picked up by the driver, does increase during this time period. But it only goes from about two minutes to about three and a half minutes. So still very reasonable. On the right-hand side, what you're seeing is a time series of the request completion rate, meaning out of riders who requested, what proportion had a vehicle dispatched to them. And in fact, that number is so close to one that you can't really see the purple, the purple curve. Contrast with an example where we had a surge outage. And this occurred in 2015, uh, New Year's Eve in uh, New York City. The period of the outage is shown in red. On the left, we're looking at the number of requests. The number of requests skyrockets during this, during this time period. And in the middle, we're looking again at those pickup times. And you can see that the pickup times skyrocket from about two minutes to about eight minutes. So very long pickup times. 
affecting the riders and the drivers. And when you look on the right-hand side, this is the worst piece of the picture. And, and technically, what, what an outage means, is this a communication failure? Or... Ah, sorry, an outage means that the prices did not rise during this time period. Because of? Because, uh, because our, our systems went down, basically. Um, so you can see that out of rider requests during the outage, fewer than 25% of those riders were actually dispatched a car. So this is a this is a failure of our system. This is an example of my first argument, which will be that the matching techniques, matching how we match riders with drivers and riders with each other in carpools, and our and techniques for dynamic pricing keep the, the amount of wasted time for riders and drivers very low in these ride hailing systems and ensure reliability of the service. I'll also show that if uh, that the introduction of some novel matching approaches could reduce the variability that's introduced by dynamic pricing. So the downside of dynamic pricing, of course, is that it leads to this variability in prices over time uh, and a bit of unpredictability in prices, both for riders and for, for drivers. So first I'll talk about a bit of context We'll walk through matching and dynamic pricing. I'll dive deep in dynamic pricing. And I'll talk about how we estimate the inputs to uh, pricing and matching algorithms, or at least illustrate how that can be done. And then I'll argue uh, that these novel matching algorithms can, can, could potentially reduce uh, price variability to the benefit of both riders and drivers. Uh, but first, a little bit about uh, my time at Uber. I, Joined Uber about three years ago. I was leading uh, the team called Marketplace, which uh, creates the pricing and matching systems for Uber, uh, and also all of the inputs to those algorithms, like the predictions of supply and demand, as well as travel time in the road network, which is part of our, our mapping service. Now I focus on the maps piece of the picture. I lead data science for Uber Maps. Maps does a bunch of different things that Eric mentioned. And here's a, an illustration of predicted travel speeds in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area road network. I'll, I'll talk a bit about this plot later. So uh, most critically for pricing and matching techniques, the mapping service does prediction of traffic and, and travel time conditions in real time and recommends routes and predicts travel times from point A to point B. So if you're dispatching a vehicle, we need to know how long it would take that driver to get to that rider. So it's a critical input to the matching systems that we'll talk about today. So I don't think I have to convince this audience that ride hailing has been growing uh, at a remarkable rate. So on the right-hand side, we're looking at the volume of Uber trips uh, by year uh, since 2010. This is through improved convenience and efficiency of the service. And I'll argue that techniques for matching riders with drivers and for calibrating demand with supply through dynamic pricing are important in creating uh, this growth. I'll argue specifically that these techniques reduce the amount of wasted time for riders and drivers on the platform, which creates a seamless service and ensures that riders and drivers really engage at high volumes uh, with the platform. So if we look on the left-hand side on the driver side of the picture and look at the percentage of time that drivers send, spend with a passenger in the vehicle, that's the time period in which they're being paid per mile per minute. Um, and compare taxi service to UberX in three different cities, we see considerably higher utilizations uh, for Uber than for the taxi services in two out of those three cities. Uh, New York City is a slightly different case because of the density of, of uh, ta both taxi and Uber in, in the city. The utilizations are very similar uh, in New York City. If we look at the rider side of the picture, yes. Do you have any intuition why the utilization is lower in New York compared to San Francisco? Uh, lower on UberX. Uh, this is 2015 data. I imagine it's, the picture has changed a little bit since then. 
Well, you know, I'm not 100% certain. Well, well, New York is flooded with cabs in some ways, so it's it just always seems like it's a bright blob of yellow, the whole city. I'm guessing that the density of cabs is higher in New York City, so that might be... It might be. There, there might be some... Yeah, I'm not a, I don't know the answer to that it's question. It's a great Manhattan, question. In Manhattan, if you just stick your arm out, a cab stops immediately, no matter where you are, most times of the day, except for when it rains. Yeah. And so that might put a dent in Uber. The Uber is in it. Just, I guess, guessing. So I'm, I'm curious, what percentage, like when the drivers are not on the street, what percentage of the time <laughs> they're uh, um, moving and what percentage they're just sitting and waiting? That's a great question. I don't have data for you in the presentation. We will talk about the implications of there's these three states that drivers cycle through and some of the implications for the mathematical models, but I don't have empirical data for you on that. Oh, on the rider side of the picture, uh, in terms of comparing the amount of wasted time for riders, the wasted time for a rider is the, is the time that they have to wait between when they request the ride and when they're picked up. Uh, and so this is a simulation comparison between ride hailing services and street hailing services, in other words, taxi style services. So the blue curve is uh, the ride hailing services and the green dotted curve is the street hailing services and in the simulated grid, uh, the authors saw lower uh, pickup times uh, for riders on the, on the uh, ride hailing services than on the street hailing services. So you can see less wasted time both for riders and for drivers. On the street, you just put your hand out and the taxi comes. But you have to wait for the, the taxi to come. So there are taxis circulating. And when the, so the rider wants a ride. You see it. So if it is two meters away from me, the waiting time is like... Zero. But into the time between when the rider wants the ride and there's a driver passing by for which they can hail. That's the way the simulation is done. Great, so the matching in the context of ride hailing means how do we match riders with drivers in the case of UberX, for example, and how do we match a riders together with each other and with a driver in these real-time carpools for Uberpool. The dynamic pricing uh, piece of the, of the puzzle, on the left I'm showing uh, the upfront price that's shown in the Uber app, and as part of calculating this upfront price, there's this uh, surge multiple. So you, you can think about a slightly simplified scenario, not quite this simple in practice, but uh, think about paying a base time and distance uh, per mile and per minute, and then when demand is much higher than supply, a, the surge multiple goes above one, meaning that riders are paying that multiple of the normal time and distance fare and drivers are being paid that multiple of the normal time and distance fare. Again, it's not quite that simple, but you can think about a 2x surge multiple as being roughly doubling the price for riders and the payment for drivers. And so, and so as we're going to talk today about how uh, a surge price might be, might be calculated, and so we're showing a heat map of the surge multiple on the right-hand side where darker purple means a higher surge multiple. Great, so the simplest matching algorithm that you could think of would be to, as soon as a rider requests a ride, to simply dispatch the car that can get to that rider the fastest. That's called the first dispatch protocol. And that's the dispatch protocol that was used in the simulation that I showed you before. So even this very simple type of dispatch protocol uh, does lead to these, these high efficiencies. That being said, there's a variety of ways to, to decrease that pickup time even more, and I'll show you an example of one. Uh, but before I do that, I do just want to point out the fact that the key input for dispatch decisions is this prediction of travel time in the road network. How long will this pickup take, for example? Question? Yeah. <clears throat> to what do you compare your, uh, when you say you, you take the, the closest one, for example, uh -huh. you say this already lowers the, as compared to what? Uh, this is, this comparison is done, so a, there's a simulation where we're comparing uh, <coughs> a call system, in other words, a, a ride hailing style system, with a street hailing service, yep, like a taxi service. How did you get the information from taxi? This, this is a simulation, again. It's a, it's a, there's a grid, 
you, uh, oh, and on the x-axis is congestion level, meaning how many uh, riders and drivers did we simulate in the grid? What's the density of riders and drivers? This is not based on, on uh, actual data. Great. So I'll show you a mechanism that can further reduce these pickup times. It's called trip upgrade, and it's a simple idea. So if a rider is matched with a driver, and then another driver becomes available, and another rider requests a ride, it may be advantageous to all parties if we swap the match instead of matching rider B with driver B. So simple concept, this match swapping. But it has to, again, it has to make everybody's uh, pickup time lower. So here's an illustration. So we'll start from the beginning. So there's rider A and driver A. They're matched together. They have a six minute ETA. And then a second driver and a second rider appear and the, the match is swapped. So simple mechanism, but you can see that it decreases the pickup time for all the parties. There's a variety of different mechanisms like this. I'm not going to get into detail on any others because I want to dive deep in the dynamic pricing context. We will come back to matching and tie it into dynamic pricing in the last section. So, so let's think about how one might calculate a surge multiple. So somehow this should be based on local supply and demand conditions. We're somehow trying to calibrate demand with supply. So on the left-hand side, I'm showing uh, a key measure of demand, which is how many riders are opening the app and checking the price as a function of geolocation. On the bottom left, I'm showing the number of open vehicles, uh, vehicles that are available to be dispatched. And somehow we need to combine these together with some other inputs to, to calculate a search multiple. Was there a question in the back? Is the search multiple expected not only to reduce the demand, but also increase the supply? Is it, is it predictable so that drivers will start driving when there's a surge? That's, that's a great question. Uh, what tends to happen is that drivers know the time periods and locations in which there tends to be high surge. Uh, and you do see that they, they come out and drive more in uh, at bar close, for example, or uh, in morning or evening rush hour these peak times and locations, yes. And it's sort of a, an effect that you'd have to see over time as people learn the surge multiple, right? So, okay. That's correct. There's more debate about whether they respond to the surge in a very short-term way, like when they see the surge, they can see the surge heat map. Uh, but it, there is a lot of evidence that they do come out and drive more at the times and locations where there tends to be surge. Great. So how might we... Um, determine this surge multiple. So I'm going to go back to very simple concepts from your Econ 101 class. We're going to build on these. This, this kind of model doesn't work straight out of the box. So you could imagine there's a demand curve as a function of price. There's a supply curve as a function of price. And there's a market equilibrium price where those two intersect. Here I'm just neglecting the fact that the platform takes a commission for simplicity, but it doesn't fundamentally change this picture. Um, and so we'll use the concept of producer surplus and consumer surplus, the producer in our case being the driver and the consumer being the rider. Um, and the, so this area in blue is, the, is a measure of how much value is created for the driver, the difference between the amount that the driver's paid and their, basically the, their costs, including opportunity costs. And on the, the red area is a measure of how much rider value is created on the platform. In other words, the difference between the value that the rider gains from the ride and the amount that they're paying. And so if we add up the red area and the blue area, that's called the welfare. And that's a measure of how much value is created for riders and drivers. OK, so it's not this simple in, our, in, in the context of ride hailing, but we need these concepts. And notice that this market equilibrium price is the price that maximizes the welfare. <coughs> okay, so in our context, there's three states that drivers cycle through. Michael referred to this earlier. 
There's the open state when they're available to be dispatched. There's the en route state where they're on their way to pick up a rider. And there's the on trip state. So the riders are sensitive not just to price, but also to pickup time, because that's the wasted time for them. The drivers, on the other hand, are sensitive to both uh, open and en route time, because they're not being paid during that time period. They're, be, they're paid during this on trip time period. So the mm -hmm. so uh, uh, I, would, I would think you can kind of split open time into two different types of time, okay. moving and not moving, like rebalancing and not rebalancing. rebalancing. And not so rebalancing. how much of rebalancing happens during that open time? Like do they move or do they stand still, like roughly? What the sense? Um, that's a great question. So how much rebalancing occurs? There is a fair amount of rebalancing that occurs in these in these systems. Sometimes the drivers do it while they're online, and sometimes they go offline and move. Um, so we have some visibility into that, but um, the, it's also a little bit tricky to measure how much rebalancing time, interestingly, because if they, if they go out of the app, turn off the app, and then come back on in a different location. Is the dominant strategy for them to uh, have the app on when they rebalance? Not necessarily, interestingly, <laughs> because sometimes they, they will... Uh, for example, in San Francisco, they drive all the way out into the suburbs. They often want to rebalance, drive into the, back into the city to get more rides. But if they leave their app on while they're driving up the highway, they can be dispatched all along the way. And the drivers report that, that they do better in terms of earnings if they rebalance all the way back to the city. So which is, they do sometimes go out of the app to move, to change geographic location in response to perceived earnings difference by geolocation. Quick question about since you're already do, do you have evidence of people that are uh, using both Lyft, dri drivers that are Lyft and, and Uber? And if you do, is, what, is there a competitive pressure on providing a better experience that would influence the economics here in terms of competing for the attention of the drivers? Yeah, the competitive angle is obviously an important one. It's a pretty complicated one. Yeah. So I think we're going to leave it aside for the purposes of this talk. But yes, there's definitely, it's not this simple because, in fact, one of the models that, the model that I'll introduce, the simplified model, assumes that there's a, uh, the number of drivers that are on the system is a response just to the, to the price and the earnings and that there's no competitor in that picture. It's a closed system. Yeah. There's only one geographic region. So it's simplified in a lot of ways. And the the, the lack of a competitor in the model that I'll show yeah. is, is one just, of the simplifications. I was imagining to the side that this, you probably have very strong evidence by watching these, these, these drivers jump around town and going off yeah. and online that they're actually using two services. They're actually driving for two services. It can be hard to tell yeah. if the driver turned off, got, went out of app in order to move, mm -hmm. rebalance, or took a trip on a competitor, for example. There's limited visibility yes. into that. Yeah. So, like, in my head, I have a, uh, a conjecture that I thought was obvious, but maybe maybe it's false, mm -hmm. uh, that if the matching pricing uh, efficiently designed, then uh, it would never be individually optimal for a driver to switch off the app while he rebalances. He would he always, in a, if matching and pricing does efficiently, I would have thought uh, that he would always be individually better off uh, by actually taking a trip uh, rather than giving up that opportunity. Is that is that theory true? <laughs> um, in practice, the drivers report that oh, yeah, that, 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 that they sometimes means, I mean, that, that might seem there is mean a that the matching pricing uh, uh, that you use is not efficient. So mm -hmm. is the yep. fact is the fact that drivers reported a proof mm -hmm. uh, that the system is inefficient, or is my conjecture wrong? Yeah, I, I think it's I think it's a reasonable to assume that there are that these matching and pricing algorithms are not perfectly efficient in terms of um, being incentive compatible and so on. So okay, so there's the sense of sensitivity to pick up time in addition to price and to the the welfare maximizing price. There's, there's actually a market equilibrium, which is a price and pickup time uh, that maximizes the welfare, for which there's not much wasted time in the system. So, so on the left-hand side, I'm showing a situation where there's not very many riders and not very many drivers. And as you can imagine, the pickup times in this scenario are very long. Uh, and, 
And so riders and drivers engage at lower rates with the platform. Whereas on the right hand side, with more riders and drivers in the system, the pickup times are low and the engagement is high. So you'll see that, that the welfare maximizing price and pickup time combination looks like this right hand side. So here's a, let's, let's make that concept rigorous. One key aspect is that there's a very strong mathematical relationship between the number of open cars in a particular geographic region and the pickup time. So here what I'm showing you is we've picked a particular geographic region and we've looked at different time periods and we've uh, gathered data on the average pickup time and on the number of open cars during those, those time periods. And then for each particular value of the open cars, like 40 open cars, all time periods in which there were 40 open cars, we look at what was the average pickup time. And that's what's shown in the blue curve. You can see that the, the pickup time decreases as a, num as a function of the number of open cars. And in fact, it fit remarkably well with a log linear model shown in red. So this, this, this clear mathematical relationship between the two. Another piece that we'll need is uh, a steady state formula for the number of cars on trip. So if we look at the trip completion rate, capital C, and we multiply by the amount of time, the average length of a trip, the average duration of a trip, that gives us the steady state number of cars on trip. So this is an application of Little's law. And so what we're going to do in the next slide is we're going to, to break down the number of total cars by the number of cars that are on trip, the number of cars that are open, and the number of cars that are on round. So here you go, the three states. And let's, for right now, let's take a fixed number of total cars. In fact, we'll, we'll in later slides, note that the number, of, the number of, the total number of cars is actually a function of the price and the pickup time and so on. But for right now, just, just think about capital N as being fixed and then decompose the number of cars into the number of open cars, capital O, the number of on-trip cars, which is the product of this trip completion rate, and the, uh, the trip time, capital T. And then let's apply Little's law again on the right-hand side to calculate the number of cars that are in this en route or pickup state. So that's the trip completion, time, trip completion rate times this uh, pickup time, eta, from, the, from two slides ago, that function, decreasing function, as a function of the number of open cars. Yes? What is the trip completion rate definition? Okay, so what we're going to see, this is a mathematical formula for how the completion, trip completion rate must relate to these number of, but we'll see in a moment, we're going to use this in order to calculate the trip completion rate as a function of the number of total cars and so on. Just the number of trips completed per unit time. Per trips completed per time. Yep. Is that clear? In steady state, the number of trips completed per open time. So it's like the throughput of the system. How, much, how many trips are we creating with this, this system? Yeah. I wonder if you thought about the obvious fourth state of a driver, which is I am not logged in into the app. Yep. But hey, I would like to get a ping if there's a search happening. Uh -huh. So I'll get open. Yeah. Because, <laughs> um, you know, people take lunches or they're at home watching the game or and they decide, you know, when is a good time to make some money? So okay. I wonder if that will affect your modeling in any way. Well, certainly there's a sense in which drivers over the long term will respond to the amount of money that they're earning, and that will be built into the model a couple slides later. Uh, you're talking about a shorter term aspect, which is if there's surge pricing right now, maybe we should give a push notification. Yeah, there is a there is a fourth state. The the so it turns out that you can capture that fourth state through modeling capital N. Instead of thinking about capital N, the number of cars as being fixed, what we're gonna do is we're gonna model it as a function of the earnings. And that's that's implicitly taking into account the fact that drivers have another option, which is not to drive at all. Great question. Yes. Congestion level doesn't affect the pick of time and open car relationship. Congestion level traffic and so on certainly does affect the uh, the uh, pickup time and the trip 
duration, capital T. We're not going to focus on that aspect. The, this, the model that we'll use will be focused on a particular time of week. So we'll condition on time of week. And so if you say take downtown San Francisco in morning rush hour, traffic conditions are roughly consistent during that time period. And so then we'll just assume a background traffic level as we fit these models. And so for example, as we were fitting that, um, that curve for pickup time versus number of open cars, that should be fit just for morning rush hour in that particular geographic area, for example. That's a great question. Yes? When you uh, uh, fit the average pickup time model, what, what was the source of the variance in the number of open cars? And so was it because there was uh, rush hour or not rush hour? Was it? Oh, um, sure. There's, there's variability in the number of open cars simply because First of all, if we, we assume that the drivers are arriving according to a Poisson process and we have a fixed geographic region, the number of cars that arrive is a Poisson random variable. Um, and so there will naturally be some variability, particularly if we look at a relatively small geographic region, there's some natural variability in the number of open cars um, just due to that Poisson noise, for example. There, then there's a, a variety of additional factors which lead to additional noise in the number of open cars. So, but you have to control for things like it, like some street was shut down and people were stuck in traffic. So. Uh, in the model for pickup time as a function of open cars, yeah. Yeah, this, this model didn't explicitly take any subtleties like that into account. It's just a simple relationship between the two. It's a surprisingly good relationship in, in this case. It seemed, to me, it seems surprisingly wide variance in the Kind of the number of, the number of open it cars. From, it went from literally zero to... <laughs> yeah, well, there's not very many time periods in which we saw those very high numbers of open cars, which is why it was a little noisier down on the right-hand side. Yeah, great. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so the number of open cars, that's actually actual numbers. Like 36 means 36 open cars, right? Yeah. So like, roughly what percentage of the entire fleet does it represent? Like, how big is that geo? Ah, okay, how big is the geo that this is based on? Yeah. Um, that's a great question. I think this is roughly a San Francisco downtown area, but I don't know how big exactly the geo is. So roughly, uh, uh, what's what's the total number of cars uh, that are occupied? Oh, oh that are on trip <laughs> yeah. uh, and so on. In other words, how does it roughly break down between the three states? Right, like the percentage well, roughly open yeah. cars versus booked cars. Are you talking about? It, uh, it's a great question. It depends on oh, whether so your, we're... On your previous slide, mm -hmm. there, there was actually an answer. I just realized it's 40. Wait, that couldn't be right. <clears throat> because you said 40, about half the time cars are on trip. Um, uh, yes, that's, that's correct. Half the time they're either open or going to the passenger. As so, a first order approximation. So let's say half of that they're open. So that sounds... Strange that there are so few cars in the entire San Francisco area. If there are only like most of the time, it's not the whole San Francisco area. It's some subregion of downtown, but I don't know how big. Okay. Yeah. Great. So let's take that supply model from this slide, and let's rearrange to put trip completion rate, which is a measure of a value created, the number of trips created. Let's put that on the left hand side. And on the right-hand side, the, the number of open cars and this pickup time, which is also a function of the number of open cars. And let's just treat N and T as being fixed for the moment, but again, we'll come back and correct that in a minute. So the, if we look at the trip completion rate, capital C, as a function of the number of open cars, that's the red curve. And then the blue curve is just the curve that you looked at before, the pickup time. And you can see that the trip completion rate is non-monotonic, that there's an optimal value O star for the number of open cars to maximize the trip completion rate. Now, if you go above, for, for values of the number of open cars that are above O star, there's a bit of a trade-off here. There's, if, we, if the number of open cars is higher, the trip completion rate is slightly lower, but then the pickup time is also slightly lower, so there might be an experience versus throughput trade-off here. So, so, the, so O star is one way to think about an optimal system, but maybe there's a bit of a trade-off. 
and, and there's a consideration around slightly higher levels of open cars. On the other hand, if you go to the left, there's really no advantage at all, just disadvantage. So we look at what happens to the left, the number of trips being completed drops, and additionally, the pickup time increases. So more wasted time for riders and drivers, fewer trips completed. It's not advantageous to anyone to be in this zone. And I'll call this the danger zone. Um, and you'll see that it has some really some implications for, uh, for the ability of the system to, to serve riders and drivers. Okay, so that was a model that just involved the supply, the, the uh, cars in different states. Yes? The danger zone. Uh, what's the implication in the danger zone for the earnings per driver? Since you have fewer open cars all the time, it would seem that the drivers would earn more in the danger zone. They actually don't earn more in the danger zone. Fewer trips are completed. They spend more time picking up than they save in terms of, they say spend less time open, but they spend much more time picking up. And they're only paid when they're in their on-trip status. And so actually, this does not increase earnings. Great, so let's come tie back, maybe let's keep moving a little bit and then we'll come back to the questions. Um, so let's tie back to prices and let's think about, in order to tie into prices and, what, and, and how surge prices might work, let's think about uh, modeling demand and supply. So for example, we need to understand how the trip request volume on the rider side might respond to that pickup time or to uh, or to the surge multiple. And so a simple model for that could be the following, the number of requests as a function of the price and the pickup time uh, as the product of the number of riders who are opening the app and checking the price, lambda, the uh, function for the price response, r, and a function for the ETA response, g. And this is a simple model in which we assume probabilistic independence between the two for illustration, and uh, if we look at the data on the bottom, the fit actually is pretty good for these. So here's the surge multiple on the x-axis, and on the y-axis, the uh, probability of request, and you can see that the blue curve is the data at each of these surge multiples, and the red curve is the fit model, and so we have a pretty good estimate except some interesting um, non-monotonicities here around 10 minutes uh, ETA. Okay, so that's a demand model. Now let's put some of the pieces together. So in, uh, in a steady state model, the number of riders requesting rides should be equal to the number of trips that are completing per unit time. And so that demand model on the left-hand side should equal the number of trips completing, which we derived on the right-hand side. Additionally, I'm not gonna go into detail on this piece, but the number of open cars, capital N, actually depends on how much the drivers are earning. This is what we talked about before. So that's a function of the price P. It's also a function of the number of trips that are completing per, per unit time per driver. So solving the system of equations yields a, the pickup time and the trip completion rate that's associated with any given price level P. Okay, and on the next slide, we'll look at that, uh, the, the amount of value, the welfare created at each, each price point, little p. This is, uh, by the way, uh, all described in a paper by Castillo and colleagues. I'm, I'm not describing Uber's surge pricing system. I'm describing how surge pricing uh, can be done and the concepts behind it. Um, the, so let's look as a function of the surge multiplier at the amount of welfare created in the system, that's the red curve. Uh, I've also shown the curve for the platform revenue. And uh, you can see that when the surge multiple drops below a certain level, the welfare drops off a cliff. Much less welfare is created. And the reason for that is that this is the danger zone. This is the zone in which, because these pickup times get long, a lot of the supply is wasted in pickup time, and it's much, much more less efficient. So the welfare maximizing price is basically just above that cutoff for the danger zone. If the price drops below that threshold, 
the welfare drops precipitously. These pickup times go up. The time on trip drops. The trip completion rate drops. OK, so what happens? It's not the supply and demand conditions fluctuate over the course of a day. And so in red, I'm showing a peak hours, again, in downtown San Francisco. And in blue, I'm showing the non-peak hours in downtown San Francisco. And you can see that the location of this danger zone is higher for the peak hours than it is for the non-peak hours. And the welfare maximizing price is lower during those non-peak hours than it is during the peak hours. And so a dy the dynamic pricing system specifically um, has to keep the price above this danger zone. And do you do it, you think it's so fragile and brittle that you want to be robust to the variation that if you're the difference between your model and reality. So, yeah. so do, you, do you do monitor, active monitoring to see where you are, or do you actually just be, try to do robust estimates that are away, away from the cliffs? So I think you're absolutely correct that, that there's a certain amount of modeling uh, noise yeah. that once you take into, into account, this is kind of playing right on the edge. Um, again, this isn't Uber's surge pricing system. It's just an illustration uh, of the concept. Got it. But yes, in practice, if you were to implement this, you would want to take that into account. Yes? Uh, at source multiplier of one, is it safe to assume that uh, that is what is the opportunity cost for the driver? So, beyond, so, uh, so any multiplier less than one, driver might be losing money, you know, compared to doing something else? Um, so certainly the supply, the sensitivity of supply to earnings is part of what went into this model. But it's not just the driver. It, this is not just the, the fact that drivers have an alternative. It's due to the fact that these, this pickup time phenomenon, where the pickup times get really, low, get really high. And so the drivers are not earning money during those long pickup times. It has more to do with that than it does to do with the, the driver's alternatives. And, Right. So one upshot of this is that dynamic pricing, is, if d dynamic pricing is disallowed, meaning that the same search multiple has to be used for all times and locations, the welfare maximizing fixed multiple is right up here with the dynamic price for the peak hours. So you end up set, the system would end up setting a higher price if dynamic pricing is not allowed, which means that fewer trips are created and less welfare is created. So this is why dynamic pricing is important in ride-hailing platforms. I'll, yeah, go ahead, yep. Okay. So, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how to estimate the inputs, but I also want to have time to talk about uh, alternative matching algorithms. Where are we on time, Eric? Well, I think we're running a little short today. A little short. Then, uh, okay. So, five till. So, can we start a little bit later in the can Yeah. Okay, so just, okay. Okay. how about 12 to 15 minutes? Sounds great. Thank you. All right, so let's come to the, back to this demand model. And remember that lambda here is the, rider, the arrival rate for rider sessions over time and per time and, and geographic unit. And um, so we have to be able to predict what lambda is, at least in the very short term, in the next five minutes, in the next 10 minutes. How many riders do we expect to open the app and check their price? And I'm going to illustrate this with New York City taxi data, which is publicly available. That's because um, demand data and geolocation for demand is, is sensitive for privacy reasons. But um, you can see that in this type of data, you get these very strong geographic patterns. This is Manhattan. Uh, you can see much higher demand in Manhattan than in surrounding areas and higher demand in the, um, in the peak times than in the middle of the night. So uh, prediction, here's a, here's a simple illustration of uh, prediction, short-term prediction of, of this demand by time and geolocation. In this case, the authors used a random forest model with discretization of latitude and longitude and time uh, with a remarkable uh, degree of success for a simple approach. And so we're showing here the prediction on the left and the actual on the right. And you can see that it basically captures the critical features. There's more density of demand in these downtown areas. It's even able to pick up the fact that there's more demand along the thoroughfares in Manhattan uh, and is able to capture those daily cycles effectively. Another in the input to the um, to 
the matching algorithms was this travel time prediction. Let's just talk about that for a moment. So what does the data look like for this type of prediction? The prediction is done using um, location data from trips. So when a driver has a passenger in the vehicle, we have GPS data during that trip. And uh, that's shown in red for a particular example, the sequence of, of points starting from top left to top right. And um, you can see that in this case, it looks like the driver went through a tunnel. There's one GPS point that has either very large noise in the latitude and longitude or an incorrect timestamp. Um, and so certainly any algorithms will need to be robust to that sort of noise. So what might, how might one do travel time prediction using this type of data? The first step is what's called map matching. And uh, John has some wonderful algorithms for this. Uh, the, shown in blue is the map matched uh, trip, meaning the route, estimated route, and the estimated, we also have to estimate the amount of time that the driver took to traverse each road segment in that route. And you can see that this case, it did pretty well. It estimated that, that the driver went through the bridge, uh, through the tunnel. OK. After this data processing step, then you can aggregate by the road segment level. So here, the histograms here, these are four histograms for four particular road segments. This is actually data from the project at, at MSR. Um, and for this particular road segment, for example, this is looking at all of the traversals of this road segment during evening rush hour. Is this 520? I think this is 520. It's something like that, yes. Yeah. yeah. But we all love 520. This is like the old bridge. <laughs> <laughs> These are the four most commonly traversed yeah. uh, highway road segments in Seattle. I don't remember exactly. And then the, the curve is, is a model that can be fit to, the, to travel speeds at the road segment level. Um, this is some particular model that we use for this project. But more generally, you can think about creating a model at the road segment level um, for predicting the travel time across that road segment, given a set of predictors, things like uh, what is the historical traffic for this road segment at this time of week? What's the historical travel time for this time of week? What's the last 15 minutes average for this road segment in terms of the travel time? How's the weather? Is it a holiday? And so on. And so there's typically a model for road segment traversal times. And then those individual predictions are going to be put together to predict the amount of travel time between an origin and a destination in a moment. Great. So, so now that we have these segment level models, you can then predict in real time the travel time on any particular road segment in the road network. And here, this is uh, showing predicted travel speed. Uh, this for the road segments in the San Francisco Bay Area overlaid on a satellite photograph. Green means faster and red means slower. And you can see that the highways have higher predicted speed in this example than downtown San Francisco side roads. Uh, this is probably the middle of the night. This is an uncongested time period. Can you share anything about um, what you actually do at Uber for predicting road speeds? For traffic you prediction. Yeah, yeah. Are, are you doing? Is the is the probe network from Uber itself good enough to do predictions based on it? Do you take in multiple sources of data like we did, we had done for Clearflow? You don't have to answer if you can't answer that question. Okay. Sure, sure. Maybe let's talk talk offline about okay, it. All right. Thank you. So the primary data source would be these traversal times for vehicles in the in the road network. But then I was curious how you generalize that to segments where they're not running. So yeah, that's a great that's, that's a great question. Flow, clear flow answer. That is the okay. So so Eric's pointing out the fact that um, using recent data is a great way to predict tra traffic if you're talking about a highway. It doesn't work so well in some of these areas with very sparse data, and so that a lot of the trick in traffic modeling is how to deal with traffic modeling right. for d areas with sparse data. That's absolutely correct. So uh, yeah, let's talk about it later. Great, so then you can put together these individual travel times to get travel time from point A to point B in the following fashion. Uh, the, the next step is to compute the fastest path based on those traffic predictions. 
there's a ton of different algorithms for this, like A star and hub labeling <laughs> algorithms and, and so on. And then you could simply sum the travel times across, across that route. You could stop there. It turns out that this doesn't work perfectly because you tend to underpredict the amount of travel time on the route. Why is that? Any guesses? Stoplights. Uh, stoplights, but that should be incorporated. That's a great, a great call out. Potentially yeah, stoplights. We try to incorporate that into the models. But yes, that's an issue. Dynamically changing. Dynamic. OK, so changes over time. Um, so the issue is that there's a consistent underprediction effect if we first find the fastest route and then predict the travel time for that route. And that's because drivers don't always take the fastest route. So, so there's an underprediction bias. And so typically at this stage, there's some kind of a bias adjustment or a second model to account for the fact that drivers are not always taking the fastest path. So it can be simple as a bias adjustment, but again, more sophisticated models are possible at this stage. OK, so I do want to come back to this concept of uh, novel matching algorithms and how might they, they help in mitigating the variability uh, of price that's introduced through dynamic pricing. But here's a simple mechanism. Um, let's think about choosing a waiting window, call that capital C, that's going to be on the rider side. And this fee could be dynamic. It could depend on supply and demand conditions. So when a rider requests a ride, instead of simply, instead of only looking at the open cars, we're going to consider both the cars that are open and the cars that are currently on trip. All the drivers, on trip drivers, within fee minutes of completing their trip. So we're going to expand the supply base in that sense. And we're going to dispatch the driver who minimizes either the time to pick up if that's an open driver, or if it's a driver that's currently on trip, the amount of time between their drop off and the location of that next rider. Okay, so let's illustrate that with an example. So here's a rider, there's four possible cars, two of which are currently open and two of which are currently on trip. So this car is five minutes from the rider, so we call that five minutes, eight minutes here. And on this side, this is a car that's four minutes from its drop-off. The drop-off location is two minutes from this rider. And so we're going to count that as two minutes, not as six minutes. OK, and then similarly for this potential match, we're going to count the five minutes and not the seven total minutes. And then we're going to try to minimize that. So in this case, we would dispatch driver C because they minimize the time between this drop-off location and the pickup. So why this mechanism? OK, notice that this is, this is a dynamic waiting mechanism. It's, it's asking drivers to wait a little bit longer instead of or in addition to paying a higher price. You could even think about dynamically adjusting that wait time and dynamically adjusting the price together. Um, but the main, the critical thing to understand about this mechanism is, is basically trying to avoid the danger zone by optimizing for less wasted time between trips for drivers. So it's asking the rider to flex a little bit in terms of their time, but it's minimizing the amount of time that drivers spend uh, between on their way to pick up riders. This is a similar concept to some of the flexing ideas in one of Uber's products, the Express Pool product, where riders are asked to wait a little bit longer before they're dispatched a driver and are also asked to walk a little bit to meet their driver. So what happens? This is a simulation for uh, downtown San Francisco, but it's based on actual uh, demand and supply data from this geo. In blue, what I'm showing is the optimal uh, dynamic waiting time if we allow uh, dynamic waiting and dynamic pricing. And in red, I'm showing the optimal dynamic waiting time if we don't allow dynamic pricing. And you can see that under the scenario where you have both dynamic waiting and dynamic 
uh, pricing, you have pretty reasonable wait times, anywhere between zero and four minutes, so not super high. These riders are being asked to wait up to four minutes longer than they normally would. Um, this scenario where dynamic pricing is not allowed leads to very long rider wait times, probably not going to work from a product perspective. So let's go back to that curve that we looked at before where we were looking at welfare as a function of the price multiplier. So you saw this, this blue curve before, although I think it was a different color. And this is the curve that showed how the danger zone affects, uh, shows up as a function of the surge multipli multiplier. So this is the curve for welfare as a function of the surge multiplier. And the, the blue curve is the case where, we, where there's dynamic pricing but not dynamic rider waiting. And the red curve is the case where both are included. And you can see that the introduction of this dynamic rider waiting moves the danger zone to the left, okay? So reduces the optimal value of the, the surge multiplier and also slightly increases the total welfare created. So if we look at the optimal surge multiplier as a function of the hour of day, the blue curve is the case without the rider waiting and the red curve is the case with the rider waiting. You can see that the, the surge multiples are generally lower and the variability is less in the surge multiple from one time period to the next. Any questions? Yeah. I have a general question about the sort of predictability of this system. So let's say you have uh, two consecutive days with exactly the same conditions in terms of demand uh -huh. and all that. I mean, how would the prices would the prices behave similarly, or all the dynamics would behave similarly? I mean, think of the notion of equilibrium. I mean, are there multiple equilibria or a single equilibrium in this kind of uh, scenarios? So, uh, single equilibrium given fixed supply and demand conditions, yeah. but the f supply and demand conditions do fluctuate a fair amount, even day to day. And so, this if you look at the the short term prediction of demand, in fact, you get these little. Um, these these local fluctuations in supply and demand. Yeah, but if I um, play exactly the same yep. demand and supply across two different days, then you'll so. get the same surge price because the surge price is a function of the supply and demand. What am I not understanding? Oh, oh, you're saying because the drivers respond. Yeah, kind of. I'm, I'm thinking. I'm thinking about the notion of uh, you know in, in in Nash setting like unique equilibrium, is there a unique equilibrium in yes. this kind of setting? Yes, so for a given price point, there is an equilibrium value for the waiting time under fixed supply and demand conditions. Okay. Uh, it, there's a theorem about that I didn't include it in the talk. Great, so to conclude, um, this growth of ride hailing is, is facilitated by these matching and pricing algorithms. Uh, these algorithms reduce the wasted time for both riders and for drivers. They require forecasts of demand, of supply and travel time. We talked about how one might generate those forecasts. We also talked about how introdu introducing different matching algorithms might be able to help decrease the price variability associated with dynamic pricing. And then there's this meta point around the fact that this isn't just machine learning that we're doing. It's a mix of economic models, uh, statistical approaches, machine learning, and optimization. Thanks very much. I have a few questions. So regarding the new matching you showed, so where you look at the drop of time and you measure only the distance uh, so that is it the entire algorithm or there is a cutoff? Because maybe there is a drop off. <coughs> the cutoff is capital is, is fee. So that is the that's what we're flexing is okay. the maximum amount of extra weighting that we would require from the rider. And the second question I had was more open ended. I'm I'm thinking like in, in terms of the drivers, like is there you have a data where uh, what is the amount of money made by the, each driver? Is it fair across all the drivers or? or uh, okay, like so fairness of earnings across yeah, because drivers. These policies can determine which driver will be dispatched to the customer. So, and it explicitly does not take into account the fairness for the drivers or something. So, so it depends on what you mean by fairness. In the, this in is, the market, these are fair mechanisms in the sense that nothing is specific to that driver, right? That the, the, the mechanisms discussed here are all mechanisms that have 
only to do with the distance between a rider and a driver, for example. They're not personalized in any sense to the driver. So they're fair in that sense. You, fairness is perhaps a longer discussion if you wanted to say, okay, if you're trying to create earnings that are as similar across drivers as possible and to reduce variability across drivers as much as possible. Um, that's, that's an interesting question and, and a longer one to address. Um, but I just want to um, see whether we are like data which says, like roughly speaking, they make the average amount of money made for the driver is roughly the same, or something. Um, like there is there's some data for that publicly available in in papers. I don't have that on the tip of my tongue. You got a question over here? Oh yeah, um, I had a question about how do you assess the demand? Say if I'm just opening my app and checking for prices, right? But I'm not requesting it. Does that go into the model of uh, does it categorize as demand? Yes, so that's exactly what Lambda was in this model for, so predicting demand. Um, the no, so it basically, we basically assume the number of riders opening the app and checking the price is, go, is just a function of, of time and geolocation. It's not a function of what price I, surge multiple we happen to have right now. Yeah. And then we assume that the chance that the rider requests after they're shown the price does depend on what price you showed them. That's how we break it down. And so then, so then this, this prediction, yeah. you have this prediction of number of riders opening the app and checking the price, yes? So if I write a script which keeps pinging the service, does that mean the prices for everyone else around me? So we up? are very, we're aware that, that people could do this, and so we have safeguards in place to avoid them specifically this. And that? So, so it seems natural that once you start allowing, uh, once you start having riders being willing to wait a little while, that the price multiple could come down a little bit. I was wondering if you guys looked at other matching mechanisms. I'm curious about, like for instance, if someone says that they're willing to wait longer, you could just sort of have them sit around for a while and then see what other customers have popped up at the same time, what cars are available then, and then do the matching in kind of a delayed fashion. Right, so, so the question was around asking riders to wait a little bit longer to be matched uh, and whether giving riders the option to wait a little bit longer might, instead of asking them to pay more, could be advantageous. Is that well, correct? I'm talking about the last section you just talked about, the mitigating price variability. Yeah. So you have this mechanism where people can wait a little longer and the way you do the matching is based on sort of where what cars are going to be close to them at that point uh -huh. in the future, right? But I could propose an alternative mechanism where uh, a customer says, you know, I'm willing to wait a couple minutes extra. So you, you, you wait the couple minutes and then see what other customers have shown up around them and what other cars are on and then do the matching. And it seems like this would be another simple alternative. I was just curious if the one that you showed is kind of the best among many that you've explored or it's just really early in the exploration of these things? Or? It turns out it's the one that's easier to analyze, which is why I used it in the simplified mathematical model. Uh -huh. But you're absolutely <laughs> correct that the sort of batching uh -huh. uh, mechanism batching, yeah. could be valuable. Um, I think Lyft talks about doing it in one of their blogs, but I'm not 100% certain about that. Um, it, certainly in uh, express pool, it's something that driver, riders see. They, they request a ride and then and then there's some time before they're actually matched uh -huh. to, to a driver. So yes, absolutely, this is used by these ride-hailing services. Okay. Yeah. Is, um, how, how creative is the team in coming up with brainstorming new mechanisms? For example, yeah. I've been on the Uber where I, I'd be able to pay a lot more for a faster ride. Okay. Well, it's like, give me an option to pay more for faster. Uh, and um, that would propagate through your whole system into new models of people, people's willingness to pay higher prices, even an auction model for, for, for getting a faster ride. Uh -huh. yeah. do, do, is, it, is it easy to, to, to suggest and test and do experiments with new ideas like this, or just really be very conservative in terms of how you roll things out? Well, I would. Um, there have been a variety of products that have been introduced that specifically leverage this difference between drivers and their trade-off between waiting time and price. And I would argue that the fact that there's Express Pool and Pool right. and UberX is ex exactly yeah, uh, yeah. exactly uh, providing that flexibility uh, to riders. You know, in terms of introducing a new product, there is a user interface change. We do have to be a little bit careful about yes. showing a fourth option when there's already a lot of options. But it's in terms of really fast, pay more, twice as much, you know. adjusting you know, some of the back-end mechanisms is yeah. a little bit more yeah. um, uh, easier to explore with. 
All right, well, let's, let's thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you.